Right, and we continue with the news on KTN News. Thank you for staying with us. Now, the Paris Club has accepted Kenya's application for debt service suspension, which now means that Kenya shillings are 32 0.9 billion of Kenya's foreign debt owed to 10 bilateral partners falling due from 1st January 2021 to 30th June 2021 stands suspended. This is according to Treasury CS Kuriatani. Now the country has already signed a memorandum of understanding with the Paris Club to be followed by individual MOUs with each country. In effect, the initiative apart from suspending the payments will give Kenya a total of five years to repay the loans with a grace period of one year. Now, Yatani said this is not only timely, but a sign of confidence in the country and will give Kenya the fiscal space to, the, to make the much needed spending on the COVID-19 economic recovery strategy, especially in the social, health and economic sectors. Now, this comes at a time where debate has been rife about Kenya's debt appetite, seeking to raise the ceiling to 12 trillion. Now, to talk more about this, I'm now joined by Ken Gishinga, the chief economist at Mentoria Economics is joining us live from our city center studio. Sa, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us on News Desk. Thank you very much, Grace. All right. Now, I know I may have said what this means, but I want to get it from you. What this means for our public debt, for Kenya's public debt. Does it mean the debt reduces? Does it mean we pay it longer? What does this mean? Indeed, uh, this has been a ro roller coaster of a journey. Um, back in April, um, this whole idea was floated that African countries, including Kenya, needed to benefit from some debt relief, uh, not least because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Kenya flatly refused that offer at that time, primarily because it felt that uh, to be seen to be missing payments will uh, almost send messages that Kenya is struggling to service its debt. Now that conversation has evolved uh, to what we saw yesterday with the communication that you've just quoted. And uh, what is now being put on the table is a debt relief package of really 32 billion that can go into social services, into healthcare, into education, and that money will be repaid later. Now Kenya's debt problem does not evaporate uh, really, we are postponing the issue, uh, but I think from Treasury's perspective, they look at this as a temporary relief uh, in terms of the country getting money to be able to meet some of the urgent measures uh, that uh, the country uh, desperately needs. Right. So uh, the key question being, and what our viewers would want to understand, have we reduced it and how if that's the case, I don't know, have we re reduced it or how much longer will we pay this debt? And if we have, at what rate? Well, uh, the debt does not go away. This is a debt relief. It's a moratorium. It only says that over the next six months, those debt payments uh, do not need to be made and the government can use it for some of the more uh, urgent areas. Now, obviously, that relief will be converted into a loan that can be paid uh, over the next five years. So in a sense, it is a basic relief. But in terms of the historical problem of debt uh, in the Kenyan economy, that conversation hasn't gone away. Our debt to GDP is still very high. Uh, we still have a lot of foreign currency debt. And that will still need an economic strategy to be able to overcome it. So it's more of a problem that has been postponed than resolved. All right. Now, there's a uh, part uh, of the statement that we received from uh, C.S. Ukuria Tani that I want you to expound for us. Allow me to read part of it. He said Kenya has also applied for debt service suspension under the G20 DSSI framework for amounts estimated at 40.6 billion shillings due from 1st January 2021 to 30th June 2021 from non Paris Club bilateral creditors. Again, what does this mean? Uh, that's a very good question. Now, the, ag the agreement for the debt relief is really coming from the Paris Club members. These are members um, who um, historically uh, meet every, um, every year to be able to look at uh, fiscal problems within countries. 
Now, the challenge has been, obviously, because of the COVID pandemic, uh, many of these countries have not been able to raise their tax revenues and are really struggling to make those payments. But they have a significant amount of loan that are outside the Paris Club. Uh, most importantly, China, which is Kenya's largest uh, bilateral lender. So the issue that big countries like China are not part of the Paris Club, uh, that is where a lot of concern will be. Will China be able to extend the same types of moratoriums, or will China still demand for its payments to be able to uh, continue as, as the schedule uh, dictates? So I think the China issue is the, it will be the elephant in the room because that is where most of our debt repayments are owed to. So uh, there will be a significant focus on whether countries like China will be able to extend uh, what the Paris Club has been able to ratify. All right. Now, the what I would call elephant in the room, and Kenya has this insatiable appetite for debt. <laughs> I would put it like that. Borrowing, we, we, we have borrowed a lot. So does this give the government more room to borrow now that you have put it well, the problem has been postponed, but as it has been postponed, does it give the government more room to borrow further? Well, it doesn't. In of itself, it doesn't give the government uh, more room. In fact, one of the smaller stories that uh, broke yesterday was the fact that all debts that are owned by state-owned agencies will need to be calculated as part of public debt. Now, that was a dramatic decision that will completely um, increase the level of public debt um, to GDP. Um, so there's that big talking point in which our parliament has been uh, uh, has been uh, requested to consider raising the debt ceiling to um, 12 trillion shillings. Obviously, that will be now the biggest event um, from today moving forward. Uh, but I think people now need to, we need to look at this from a longer term perspective in terms of how sustainable is it in terms of getting into these big debt um, situations where you are unable to service that debt. I think that uh, cry has reached a crescendo, and I think, it's, it, I think it'll play out in a very uh, interesting way this year, especially when that debate comes to the floor of the House in terms of raising that uh, public debt. So it's still a major problem that still has an outstanding solution pending. All right. Now, knowing the government, the Kenyan government, uh, we are likely to, to borrow more. So what are the implications of this? What are the implications to Wanjiko, to the common Wananchi? Because it all narrows down to the common Wananchi. I mean, revenues have, re have, have reduced, uh, businesses are down. Time and time again, um, uh, KRA usually fails to meet their, demand, uh, their target. Rather. So what are the implications of this if the government decides to borrow more? The most natural implication is higher taxes. And already we've seen the tax reliefs that were given last year have already been reversed. Um, the VAT on the income tax, all those have been reversed. So the Kenyan citizen, the Wanjiko, uh, the Kenyan businessman, has to be ready to pay more taxes uh, to be able to uh, uh, participate in the economy. Now, when you have more taxes in the economy, it means the prices of things become very expensive and the cost of living um, actually goes up. And that's the reason why Kenyan products are always considered to be the most expensive in the region. That's why it's very, very difficult to export Kenyan products to other parts of Africa because they are considered to be too expensive. So I think the long run effect of when you have too much debt, it means you have too much taxes. When you have too much taxes, you become very uncompetitive and businesses choose to divest and go to places where they have uh, better tax measures. So it's in the best interest that policymakers really look at uh, lowering our appetite for debt, which will mean lowering our taxes and creating a more favorable environment for businesses to thrive. Right, and already we are feeling the effect of it. I mean, prices of uh, certain commodities have already risen, milk, bread, sugar, you know, name it. But then, um, uh, still on this insatiable appetite, uh, what's at stake with this appetite? If we borrow more, what's at stake? Do we risk perhaps defaulting? 
Well, that is always a possibility. We saw countries like Zambia are defaulting um, on their debt. So it's, 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 it's always a possibility. Um, uh, the IMF and the World Bank have um, stated that developing countries should not have more than 40% a debt to GDP ratio. Now we are in the 60%. Now that's not very sustainable. So I think for any policymaker looking at uh, what a sustainable country Kenya looks like in the future, it really has to be about uh, reducing uh, that level of borrowing and really having, um, going back to the days when you know, um, ca the, ca the country depended on itself in terms of commerce, in terms of revenue generation, and using that money that is raised in revenue generation to be plowed back um, to the economy. Um, I think what we are seeing right now is that huge appetite for debt is creating major problems, even on investment cycles, where the government bond is providing the highest returns of all the asset classes. So nobody in Kenya invests in stocks or in uh, property because the government securities offer the, boss, the most return. So it, it's also creating very perverse incentives within the investment community. So I think the long-term thinking has to be in reducing that appetite for debt and really being able now to um, stimulate um, the, the, especially the smaller, smaller, small business segment of the market. Reducing that appetite for debt, with all honesty, Mr. Gishinga, is it possible? Well, it is possible to reduce um, that appetite for debt. I've always argued um, that, first of all, um, the government is involved in too many things that it doesn't need to be involved in. If you look at the primary role of the state, it's really around um, the judiciary, it's about law and order, it's about uh, infrastructure. But all these other things, there is a possibility that the government can start delegating them to either the counties or to the private sector, and the government just focuses on the things around uh, justice, security, and law and order. I think if the government is able to um, release some of these functions to smaller entities like the counties, devolve most of these, then it will not require that significant budget, and it will not require the need to borrow as much money as it is. I think where we are right now is where the government is involved in every sector of the economy, uh, it has to then borrow to be able to sustain salaries, to be able to pay rent and such things. So I think that the key thing is for us to really go back to that philosophical question of what is the role of the state and how can we limit the budget uh, for the state to only con to, to be involved in the things that are the role of the state that every other activity can be released to uh, the counties or to the private sector. All right, uh, we need to wrap up. But before that, let me take you back to the statement by C.S. Yatani. That other bit that reads, this is not only timely, but a sign of confidence in the country and will give us the space to make the much-needed spending on the COVID-19 economic recovery strategy, especially in the social health and economic sectors. I want to talk about that, the COVID-19 economic recovery strategy. Because COVID, the pandemic, has really, really hit us hard. Well, indeed. I mean, I think the most urgent situation has been in the education sector when uh, last week um, students resumed schools and our schools were largely underfunded. Um, uh, yes, there was that 14 billion shillings that the Treasury promised to schools. But if you really think of the needs of uh, the schools in terms of um, extra desks and uh, bigger spaces, uh, bigger classrooms. That was a significant budget that needed money. If you think of the healthcare uh, area where doctors are demanding for PPEs, uh, you know, that requires um, some financing and some money. So I think that pressure in those, especially in the education and the health sector, have made it very, very important uh, for these um, extra funds uh, that are coming through the debt relief to be able to be plugged in. Now, what would be a problem no, is in the no. scenario, for example, that um, China question. does not uh, extend that debt relief. And you remember there are some elements of Chinese loans that need to be paid this month. If that money is transferred towards paying Chinese debt, then it ends up really uh, being um, not really entirely useful to the country. So it's very, very important that countries like China 
uh, part of this uh, initiative. Otherwise, it's going to be moving debt payment from one part and being able to service another part and not really being, it being felt in the economy. And that's what we really need to be feeling right now. Right. Uh, lastly, because again, as I said before, it all narrows down to Wanjiko. I mean, Wanjiko feels the, the ripple effect of all this. Are we staring at tougher times ahead? Because again, as I said, already we've seen prices of various commodities Oh, they have already uh, risen, you know, basic commodities, sugar, um, uh, onga, milk, uh, oil, and all that. Are we staring at tougher times ahead? Well, that is definitely a possibility. When taxes are coming up, and there are a lot of new taxes that have been introduced this year, including the digital service tax, um, when a country is overtaxed, I mean, economics is what we call the laffer curve. And when a country is overtaxed beyond uh, a certain point, then people start, stop participating in business, people divest, and people end up going to other uh, activities that they find worthwhile. So it's very important that indeed, yes, we need the revenues, yes, we need the taxes, but you can't overtax a country into prosperity. I think we've reached that tipping point upon which if we go any further, then we might lose now people in terms of them going to just do other, to look for other countries to invest in. So it's very important that the policy makers make sure that, you know, we don't cross that tipping point. Because once you cross that tipping point, it's very, very difficult to uh, have a meaningful economic recovery. I know that was my last question, but you brought up, you mentioned digital service tax. And my goodness, a lot of people have talked about this. Isn't it asking for too much from us? Indeed, uh, because, you know, when a lot of one of the few sectors that has been thriving um, during COVID has been the digital sector because people are working from home and it works very well in sectors where you can work from home. And I think uh, uh, the government has seen this uh, as a great opportunity to be able to raise revenue. Uh, but the problem is most of these companies that are coming up, these are companies that are in um, uh, that are showcasing their products on social media, on the internet, on, on, on such platforms. When you end up starting introducing taxes that become a barrier for them to succeed, it's very easy for them again to fall. So I think again, it's really the balance, the government being able to look at the balance between how much revenue can we reasonably make without disincentivizing people to move away from productive enterprises that could have created jobs and prosperity. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Ken Gishinga there, the CEO of um, Mentoria Economics. Thank you for joining us live from our city centre studios. It's always a pleasure having you, sir. Now, let's cross borders and take you to South Africa, where the new COVID-19 variant is raising alarm globally. So just how dangerous is this strain and will vaccines work against it? Rosanna Philpott reports.